Communication uh, Software. Thank you very much for coming here. Uh, Joe hat gestern den DRC, den Wordcamper-Preis bekommen. Und wir als DRC-Vorstand sind natürlich sehr, sehr glücklich, dass der Joe hier gekommen ist, um mal seine ganzen Software-Sachen uh, vorzustellen und euch dann befragt. Super. Good morning, uh, everyone. It's very nice to be here with you, and I can only apologize that the room is not uh, more comfortable for some of you who are sitting in places where it's going to be difficult to see the screen, etc. Good, so <laughs> that will be nice. Uh, we're right on schedule. You may be aware that the uh, work for which uh, I was invited to Stockholm some uh, years ago uh, involved an Uh, a clock comparison experiment, so we're, it's important that we start on time here. <laughs> so, uh, it, it is a great pleasure to be in Friedrichshafen uh, for my first time, uh, and uh, of course you have a, a wonderful site here for uh, a ham radio uh, exhibition. So, I understand that a few of you have had fun playing with our software. <laughs> and, and that's wonderful. maybe some in this room or some who did not come to this room who think this is the end of ham radio. <laughs> And that's okay too. Uh, there's lots of room for uh, everybody in our hobby. So let me just get started. Uh, this project, um, uh, WSJT, was the name of the program at first uh, because I couldn't think of a better name. Uh, I was interested, uh, let me And to say a few things about uh, how I started this project back in uh, just after the turn of the century. Um, I was a ham in 1954, so uh, uh, that was a, <laughs> many years ago when I was a young boy. Uh, and uh, when I uh, went, finished my uh, university work and, and went on to do a, a, a doctor degree in, in, uh, in physics, um, I was busy raising a family and, and with my professional work, and although I kept my code speed up and I otherwise uh, enjoyed ham radio once or twice a year, I was not active on, on the air for, uh, for about 35 years. But around the time that uh, my professional work was starting to wind down, I was no longer training graduate students, I uh, returned uh, to ham radio uh, and picked up the hobby again. My children were grown by that time, and, and I had uh, time to, to put up some antennas and get back on the air, and I uh, wanted to turn my attention back to the VHF bands, which I had enjoyed a great deal as a youngster, uh, uh, and thought about ways in which to put my uh, knowledge of, of uh, digital signal processing, which had been developed for professional reasons, uh, to work in ham radio. So I developed this software called WSJT, which we used for um, doing meteor scatter and then moon bounce, EME. Uh, and it turned out that uh, that software was also uh, very uh, attractive for uh, low power DXing on the HF bands. And that was not my principal interest at the time, but, but uh, in any case, it, it became one of the uh, driving forces behind the software development. Uh, later, we developed a program called MAP65, which is very useful for doing uh, EME. Uh, uh, we developed the, the program known as Whisper, which was very helpful for doing uh, very low power uh, signals uh, that are detectable around the world, even with compromised antennas. Some of you, I'm sure, have played with Whisper. And finally, starting around uh, uh, 2010, uh, we started the development work which led to the current version of the program known as WSJT-X. The X, what's the X for? Well, again, I couldn't think of a better name for the program. X means extended or experimental. It was experimental at first, something like that. Uh, and anyway, uh, we sort of kept all of the useful developments in the earlier versions of the software uh, and uh, kept them in WSJTX. Uh, as you know, that program is now useful uh, for uh, interesting work on all the way from the uh, very low frequency bands uh, uh, down below the uh, AM broadcast band up through uh, HF, VHF, and, and on up uh, into the microwave bands. And there are something like, I think it's roughly 20,000 to 25,000 active users today of uh, WSJTX and 
its uh, derivative programs such as one called JTDX, written in Russia, and uh, uh, MSHV. Uh, uh, those are also uh, programs derived from the original software in WSJTX. So FT8, the, the, the mode which is so uh, widely popular today, uh, was introduced only about two years ago, uh, July 2017. Uh, the reason for the development, frankly, was that in uh, June, July of 2016, the Northern Hemisphere uh, time of the year when uh, six meters sporadic E is particularly uh, attractive. Uh, in 2016, uh, we started to realize that the using JT65 with one minute transmissions uh, was very inefficient for running for working sporadic E openings. And uh, so we wanted a, 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 a mode with a shorter turnaround, which would still maintain many of the advantages for doing uh, very brief QSOs, uh, exchange only of signal reports and, and uh, uh, call signs and, and maybe a locator and a uh, little more information than that. So it was designed for the instances on sporadic E, uh, where, uh, particularly multi-hop sporadic E, where the openings are short, the signals may be weak, uh, and um, you want to try to make QSOs with interesting places. Uh, so the mode uses uh, very short messages, uh, structured messages that uh, pack a lot of information into a small number of digital bits. I'll say some more things about that in a moment. It uses time sequences so that your computer needs to be uh, set to an accurate uh, clock and uh, maintain timing. Uh, 15 second transmissions in each direction. And it works down to signal to noise ratios on the order of minus 21 dB. Uh, and I'm sure most of you are, are uh, very familiar with this. Uh, we measure those band, those signal to noise ratios in a bandwidth equal to the uh, basically a single sideband uh, transceiver's bandwidth, two and a half kilohertz. So it's uh, you know the signals are below the noise in the sense that uh, the weakest signals that are decodable with FT8 are not uh, audible. You can't hear them uh, uh, if they're below about minus 15 on this scale. They're not audible, uh, but uh, some of them, of course, you hear very easily on your signal, uh, on your uh, on your speaker, or in your headphones. So the, the mode turns out to be, in addition to being very effective for uh, six meter multi hop sporadic E, which is what we had in mind, it's also very effective for HF DXing uh, and also VHF uh, DXing in other kinds of modes other than sporadic E. So it, it, it is simply useful for making fast minimal QSOs, uh, it's no good for, for chatting or, or uh, talking to your friends, uh, that's not the purpose here. We just want to make a quick contact and on to the next one. Uh, I should mention that uh, the F in FT8 uh, stands for Stephen Frank, uh, my good friend, Kilo 9 Alpha November, and the other uh, uh, core member of our development team right now is Bill Somerville in England. Uh, Gulf Four Whiskey Juliet Sierra, uh, and uh, Steve is uh, very much involved with the design of the individual modes, like FT8, including the encoding and decoding of the of the information. He's uh, very good with with uh, digital signal processing in all of its forms. Uh, Bill is especially the expert on uh, rig control and on making sure that our software is easily. Uh, portable to uh, each of the major platforms, Windows and Linux and uh, Macintosh. And uh, Bill is extremely good at, at these. Bill is really the only, the only real programmer in our group. <laughs> right? I'm a physicist and I learned to program, but uh, you know, I'm not a real uh, trained programmer. And same thing with Steve. Steve is an, a, an engineer. Uh, he's, a, he's a professor of electrical engineering at the University of Illinois. Uh, so uh, I think I've already mentioned uh, the other thing on that slide, so let's go on. I think uh, most of you are probably familiar with this statistical analysis of QSOs over the last few years, made by the folks who run uh, Club Log. Uh, you can see where the uh, mode took off in, in the middle of uh, 2017, and it more or less immediately replaced uh, the JT65 and JT9 on the HF bands, where most of these QSOs are made. And by the middle of, uh, or the end of 2017, already uh, there were more FT8 QSOs being uploaded to uh, Club Log than uh, any other mode. 
Uh, today, it's somewhere around 60 or 70 percent, perhaps, uh, at the end of 2019, uh, 2018, the beginning of 2019. Now, of course, uh, that's only one way of measuring activity, and these QSOs have very little information exchange. We, you know, we trade call signs and signal reports and maybe a locator and that's it. And lots of other QSOs take longer and have a lot more information. So, it, you know, this is an unfair comparison in a way, but at least if we're talking about QSOs that are uploaded to, uh, to Club Log or put in your own log, uh, it, it, it's a, a tribute to how much uh, uh, FD8 has caught on. Uh, it, I think it's worth saying that FD8 has made it possible for people with restricted uh, stations for one reason or another, low power, small antennas, and so forth, can get on and work the world, basically, uh, with FG8, even at the bottom of the sunspot cycle, which is uh, uh, rather, uh, you know, it's, 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 a, it's a great addition to our hobby, I think. So, uh, one of the reasons that FT8 has become uh, popular is that, uh, we, you know, almost everybody has a computer in the shack these days, so that it's easy to, to uh, hook that up to your, to your radio, and uh, everybody has internet, most everybody has internet access so that uh, we can use uh, useful tools in addition to the uh, communication tool itself. This, this uh, website known as PSK Reporter, which I'll say more about and show you some examples of. Uh, let me just see a show of hands, who uses PSK Reporter in here? Well, okay, at least half the people in the room seem to know what it's about. Uh, it, it basically, when FT8 decodes a, a call with a CQ and a, and a, a call sign and a locator, uh, uh, if, if you have checked off the appropriate boxes in the setup uh, screens, uh, it uploads uh, that information to PSK Reporter, and the, the central website can then uh, plot on a map uh, these, where these spots are coming from and who is copying whom. So uh, it's easy to see where the band is open to and who you should be able to work. Uh, typically, there's just some numbers there that give the, the uh, typical number of spots being uploaded in FT8 mode to a PSK Reporter in a lot of these different ways of, of measuring things, and there are just a, a lot of activity being uh, reflected on PSK Reporter these days. I'll, I'll, I'll come back to that uh, stuff in a minute and show you some some uh, some maps of it. You, you're probably many of you are familiar with that already, but in the meantime, let me say a few more things about the protocol itself. If you're interested in this kind of uh, thing, how the information is encoded, uh, I'll just run down some of the details here. Again, we're using fairly simple messages, and we always compress whatever the message is into exactly the same number of information-carrying bits. It's, it turns out right now it's 77 bits uh, that are in, in, uh, uh, in the uh, information payload of every 15-second transmission in FT8. Now, in addition to those 77 information bits, we include an error detection, so-called cyclic redundancy code, or CRC, of 14 bits, so that the decoder, when it uh, receives the signal, can tell whether it had got the message exactly correct or not, uh, because from the 77 information bits, you can calculate what the 14-bit CRC should be. And so the chances of getting a correct CRC uh, with incorrect data are very small. Um, we then use uh, additional encoding, so-called forward error correction, uh, which uh, uses a, uh, an algorithm known as a low density parity check code, LDPC. That turned out to be one of the uh, latest uh, forms of, of encoding uh, being studied widely by information theory types in uh, university uh, uh, computer science departments. Uh, a low density parity check code is traced all the way back to around 1960 uh, when it was first described in a PhD thesis by a man named Gallagher. Uh, uh, it was turned out the codes were not widely used for a long time because they were difficult to decode and required significant computer power to do that, uh, which was not available in the 1960s, and so they were kind of overlooked for many decades. But today our computers are so, so fast compared to anything that could have been imagined in 1960 that uh, low density parity check codes, which can be very efficient, uh, are easily decoded. And that's uh, the work that uh, goes into the, the uh, decoding in, in uh, FT8. In addition to, the, uh, to this frame of 174 bits, 
uh, of which 91 are uh, composed of the 77 information bits and the 14-bit cyclic redundancy check. Uh, in addition to those bits, we uh, transmit uh, three uh, so-called Custis arrays, which allow synchronization in time and frequency between the transmission and the reception. Uh, those are important as well because the, uh, uh, the receiver needs to know the exact zero frequency of the transmitted signal. Uh, in order to decode it properly. And it needs to know when the symbols actually start and when they end.